happening now. Uh, so good morning, everybody. You're very welcome to the Seeking Asylum in Ireland webinar. Um, we're delighted to have Carl Quinn, who's a barrister and part-time resource worker with Limerick and Clare ETB. You may know Carl from previous ESOL workshops or conferences, etc. Just to explain about what's going to happen this morning, I'm going to hand over to Carl and I'll mute my microphone and turn off my camera and you'll just see Carl and his slides. Uh, the slides will be available at the end. If anyone wants to email me, I can send them on. And we're also recording this session. So in a day or two, it takes us to edit it and get it up on the NALA website. We're all learning new skills. We'll have, the, we'll have that up. Um, for the questions part, while Carl is speaking, you're free to write in a question, but he, Carl will deal with it at the end. So on your toolbar, if you scroll down to near the bottom, you see the questions option. If you click on that, you can type in your question either while Carl is speaking, he won't, it won't disturb him, he won't see it, or at the end. And at the end, I'll leave everyone muted, but I'll unmute myself and I'll read out the questions and Carl will then verbally take each question one at a time. So that's how we're going to do it. So um, I'll hand you over to Carl. All the best, Carl. Thanks, Fergus. So good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Carl Quinn. I'm a barrister and a part-time resource worker with Limerick and Clare Education Training Board. So uh, today's seminar is about looking at the international protection system in Ireland. So I'm going to look at, first of all, um, some stats, some context. Then we'll look at how the international protection system works. I've got two case studies I'm going to go through with you. And I'm going to give you a very short update on, on the right to work and on driving licenses, which I know some people have been asking about as well with regards to um, asylum seekers. So just a bit of background, these stats are from 2018. The 2019 stats are, aren't fully collated yet, but there isn't a huge difference between 2018 and 2019. So over half a million first time asylum seekers applied for international protection in the European Union in 2018. And as you can see from the figures there, um, Germany took about 28% of asylum seekers, then you France, Greece, Spain, Italy, and the UK. So huge, huge numbers of asylum seekers coming in to the European Union. The main countries of origin are Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan. And I suppose from the first three there, you can see that these are essentially um, countries that are in, in, in the depths of war or are coming out of wars or, or have... Um, uh, issues with, with serious human rights um, abuses. And with regards to getting status, then 37% of people who have applied uh, for international protection have uh, gotten their status. And that kind of fits with the Irish figure as well. It's about it's about a third of people who apply for international protection actually get their get their status. This is an interesting chart. It just looks at, at um, I suppose, the history of international protection in Ireland. If you look at the very left, um, in 1991, nine people applied for asylum in Ireland. Ten years later, in 2001, we had 10,000 people applying for international protection. Again, I suppose this was during the, <clears throat> the Celtic Tiger and huge amounts of people coming in coming into Ireland. Ten years later, again, in 2011, I suppose, during the last recession, we had 1,200 people seeking asylum. Um, at the moment, there's about three or 4,000 people a year seeking seeking asylum. So that's just an, inter an interesting chart on, on the last, I suppose, 30 years of, of um, asylum in Ireland. So in 2018, there was 3,500 people applied for international protection. Um, and that's was an increase on 2017. And we reckon that last year in 2019, there was a 60% increase. So, and it, now this year, at the start of this year, there were large numbers of people seeking asylum, but obviously that has dropped off in the last two months due to, you know, people not being able to come into Ireland and people not being able to, to travel. So the numbers are, are, still, quite, are still quite high. Um, six and a half, almost six and a half thousand people were living in direct provision or emergency accommodation. And that figure is, at the moment, that figure is in and about six and a half to seven thousand people living in 
direct provision. And over 700 of those um, have got refugee status, but they can't leave the direct provision system because they don't have any place to live. So that is becoming a problem for, I suppose, the authorities, people that, that have status but can't get accommodation. They're entitled to stay in direct provision for up to one year after getting their status. Um, but after that, it's essentially they have to find some place to live. There is a, the average length of time that people spend in accommodation centres is 24 months. Now, anecdotally, that can be that that's a pretty, I suppose, conservative figure. You know, there is stories of people spending five and six years up in in um, direct provision, and sometimes people have been there for eight, nine, and even ten years. So the state has to provide accommodation for our people. So the state is under pressure to find accommodation for our people. And what's adding to it is the housing crisis. <clears throat> now, things might be changed after we come out of the current <clears throat> um, crisis, but we'll, we'll, we'll just have to see with, with regards to how that's going to work. The main countries where people are coming from are Albania, Georgia, Syria, Zimbabwe, and Nigeria. And again, that was more or less the same for, for last year. This is just a, an overview of the direct provision centers. And again, as, as Fergus was saying, we'll be putting this presentation up on the DALA website, so it'll give you a, a better opportunity to go through um, you know, the actual direct provision centers that are in your particular counties or your particular regions. There's a second slide um, of these as well. So these are the direct provision centers as of uh, the 4th of November 2019, so just, just about six months ago. Even in Clare since then, we've had another direct provision center in, in Ennis, where we have 60 asylum seekers living there. So you can see there's quite a, a widespread Clare, Cork, Dublin, Galway, <coughs> Kerry, there's six in Kerry. Um, and again, you know, the, it just it, it's countrywide or the the right provision centers if you look at Limerick there the one in Mount Trenchard has closed and a lot of um, those residents have been moved to other direct provision centers in in the region some have gone to Ennis and, and other parts of Limerick so again looking at Loud, Tipperary, Waterford, Wicklow, Westmeath so yeah there's 39 centers and on top these are direct provision centers there's also emergency accommodation where and these are often hotels or hostels where people um, are staying because they can't get a place in direct provision. So then they go into um, emergency accommodation. So the main part of this presentation is just showing you how the system works. I've, I've gone through, I suppose, the numbers and where people are staying. So we've, we have about six to 7,000 people um, seeking international protection or seeking asylum in Ireland, and most of them are living in direct provision centres scattered across the country. So to get refugee status, there are five grounds for refugee status, um, political opinion, race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular uh, social group. So for instance, um, with regards to religion, you might be a Christian in a Muslim dominated country where um, you're being persecuted because you're a Christian, or vice versa, you might be a Muslim in a Christian-dominated country where you're being persecuted for your for your your religion, and therefore you can flee that particular country and seek international protection in a safe country like Ireland or UK or wherever you want to go. Um, so you know, I I, I could do a whole <clears throat> a whole day's presentation on uh, the various types of of refugee status, and if if if, again, if that's something that people want, we can look at uh, doing some other workshops on, on in this particular area. If you don't qualify as a refugee under any of these grounds, you can apply for what is called subsidiary protection. So subsidiary protection means if you don't qualify as a refugee under the political, national or, or racial grounds, but there are substantial grounds um, for believing that if you returned to your country of origin that you would face a real risk of <clears throat> suffering serious harm so you don't qualify as a refugee but it might be very very dangerous for you to go back to your country 
if you don't qualify for refugee status or subsidiary protection, you can apply for permission to remain. And this is granted um, mainly on humanitarian or other compelling reasons. And you, you've, you've probably seen stuff in the news, maybe about teenagers or families that are, are they have kids in secondary school and they've been issued with deportation orders. So an, an appeal is made to the minister that these families and these um, people are allowed to stay in Ireland on humanitarian on humanitarian grounds. So the international protection system is governed by the International Protection Act 2015. So when somebody arrives, say from Zimbabwe or Nigeria or Iraq or Afghanistan, when they arrive in Dublin Airport or Dublin Port or Rosslare Harbour or any of those uh, ports of entry, they can claim asylum there at the airport or else if you come in through Belfast and come down through, uh, through Northern Ireland, you can go straight to the International Protection Office, which is Mount Street, and you claim asylum. So you fill up a, a very short form. Um, you're given a card, and you're also given you're given accommodation there and then. So mainly, people are sent to Bad Seskin in Dublin when they when they arrive first. So you've you've started off your first phase of of seeking asylum or, or seeking international protection. So after you've claimed asylum you've formally claimed asylum, you're given a detailed questionnaire. Now this questionnaire, it contains 90 questions covering all aspects of a person's life. So it looks at their personal life, where they were born, where they went to school, their parents' names, their siblings' names, if they're married, have they got children, what's their religion, where have they worked, when did they work there, what, what's their religion, what's their spouse's religion, it looks at um, where they have traveled to before. And then the main part of it is the reasons that they're seeking asylum. So they have to give a, a detailed account in, in writing, and it can often be a couple of pages long as to why they're seeking asylum. So they go through their actual story about what, what happened to them. Um, they also have to write in if, if they've got any medical reports, if they were beaten in any way, if they made any reports to the police. So the more documentation that they have, um, the better. They also give details of how they travel to Ireland because there's another system known as the Dublin Tree Convention, whereas if, if you say arrive in the UK first and you're fingerprinted there that you have to claim asylum in the UK as opposed to coming to, uh, as opposed to claiming asylum in Ireland. So they fill out this form, uh, this questionnaire for nine, it's, it's 90 questions. It's in several different languages. So, you know, if, if, if English isn't their first language, they can finish out in, there's a huge amount of languages that the form can be filled out in, and they just translate it. And people are given legal aid during the asylum process. So um, people are, are advised really to uh, get legal assistance when they're filling out the questionnaire. It's a huge, hugely, hugely important, important document. So after the questionnaire is gone, gone in, they've a month to submit the questionnaire after claiming asylum. So when the questionnaire is sent in, they are obviously living in direct provision. And the first part of their application then is a substantive interview. Now, this can be any time. There's no set criteria as to when it's held. Some people have been here for two months and they've had their substantive interview. More people have been waiting 18 months for a substantive interview. Again, it, it really depends on how busy or how many applicants there are at any particular time. So that substantive interview, that is, is, is the first interview they have with the Department of Justice. There are, there's just the applicants, goes to Mount Street where the International Protection Office is, and they're interviewed by somebody from the Department of Justice. The interview is more or less based on the questionnaire that they submitted. The questions are more or less the same. And what they're trying to do is just to establish that the story um, is credible. So it's it's not um, a competitive style of, of an interview. It's not meant to be competitive or meant to be aggressive. It's just someone asking questions. And the interview has a set list of questions that they ask. So they ask the questions and the app can give the answers as best as best they can. And if they need an interpreter, an interpreter is, is present.
So <clears throat> again, as I said, in the interview, people are asked questions on you know all aspects of after life. It's, it's the same as as what came up in their in their question. I think one of the issues people have if if they have a traumatic story, you know, if if they had been you know assaulted or imprisoned or tortured, uh, if they lost family members, you know, they are retelling their story, so it, it can be traumatic for people. And they've also had to write down the story in in their questionnaire, so they're they're telling their story again here. So it, it can be difficult in 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 that sense. Those interviews normally take about two, sometimes they can take three hours. Obviously, if you have an interpreter, it can take a little bit longer, or if the story has a lot of detail or is more complex, it can also take a little bit longer. So once you've done your interview, then it takes about three or four months to get a, a decision. And then now again, this is this is an average. Sometimes you can get a decision after a month, sometimes it can be six months. So again, it depends on you know really how complex the story is. You know how much documentary evidence is there how busy the actual person who has interviewed them is because they might have, have, have had a plethora of cases that particular week so if they get a positive decision they're granted refugee status if, if they qualify under any of those grounds or if they don't get refugee status they may get subsidiary protection and if they get neither of these they may be granted permission to remain on the first on, on the first hearing if they get a negative decision from their first interview, then they have the option to make an appeal for refugee status. That's RS is refugee status. I should have put in refugee status and SP is subsidiary protection. So they can make an appeal to the International Protection Appeals Tribunal. Now, this is an independent organization and they that office is also in Dublin. So you've got a negative decision, you're making an appeal, you go to what's called the we know it as the, the IPAT, International Protection Appeals Tribunal. And again, the appeal date can be six, three to six months down the line from when you've got your decision. So you've put in your questionnaire, you're waiting maybe months to get your interview, you've had your interview, you get your decision after three or four months. Then when you get your decision, you decide whether or not you want to appeal. So when you appeal, again, you can be waiting three to six months to get an actual appeal date. So you can see why people are spending so long in, in indirect provision because they're given the volume of people that are applying for asylum, um, I suppose given the shortage of people who are actually doing the hearings or given the amount of hearings that you can actually do in any particular week, um, it, 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 it does take time. So the appeal hearing is called the IPAT hearing. Um, this can take about two hours. I've been in hearings that have taken maybe three or four hours. And again, a hearing might take one hour, might be pretty short. So in those appeal hearings, now they, they are, you're, you're not in a court, you're, you're just in, in an ordinary room. There's, there's a table. Um, I'm sitting at one side with, with the person seeking asylum and our interpreter at the other side of the table. There's someone from the Department of Justice who's known as a presenting officer. And then at the top of the table, there's a chairperson known as the tribunal member. Uh, you don't wear court, you just dress formally, you know, the suit. We, we don't wear court gear or, or anything like that. Uh, and again, it's it's not meant to be a combative experience. The idea is 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 that the person seeking asylum tell their story as best as best they can. So at, at that hearing, you have the applicant, their lawyer. The chairperson, some of the Department of Justice, and the interpreter. So what happens at those hearings is I'll take my client through their actual story and ask them questions about where they're from, about their family, about why they came to Ireland. So we go through the story from start to finish, and they'll tell their story, and I'll I'll guide them through it um, as best I can. And if obviously if there's an interpreter, we'll use an interpreter. Then the person from Department of Justice will do a very short cross-examination, just try to clarify some issues. Uh, there's often issues of credibility, so or of, of conflicted stories. So they'll be asked to, um, you know, explain those discrepancies. And again, um, <clears throat> the decision for the appeal can take um, two to three months. So again, if if it's positive, they're given refugee status or subsidy protection, and if it's negative, they can get a review of their permission to remain take a judicial review to the High Court, or obviously they'll have to leave the state or get a deportation order. So that's when it gets pretty serious.
for our people. So this is a case study of an Afghanistan man that I worked with. His father worked in an NGO and he was threatened by ISIS to leave the organization. Uh, he refused to leave the organization and his father was killed by ISIS. My client's brother then he sought revenge and he attacked the ISIS members on the street one day. They retaliated, they attacked his house, he was wounded and his brother was killed. So quite a horrific story. So he fled Afghanistan using false documentation, paid people smugglers, spent time in Calais, crossed into the UK, came to Ireland and claimed asylum in, in Ireland. And unfortunately, this is quite this can be a typical story, particularly from that part, that part of the globe. So he was initially refused asylum because he couldn't prove his nationality. He had no documentation, he had no passport, he had no birth cert, he had absolutely nothing. He had a limited knowledge of his local area in Afghanistan and he didn't know the currency of Afghanistan. So he was asked, what happens in, 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 in I suppose, the hearings is, the first thing you have to prove is, is your nationality and if you don't have a passport or, or birth cert or anything like that, you're just asked questions about, you know, tell me about the local towns, the local rivers, the local currency, just to show that you actually know um, something about the particular country. So we argued on appeal that because he had no education, and again, this is where your, your I suppose, um, adult basic education or adult literacy collides with, with the legal system, which was very, very useful for me, having worked in, in adult education for almost 20 years. You know, someone would, my client had, had never been to school, so we argued that because he had a limited education, he wouldn't have known the local geography. Well, he would have known some of it, but he wouldn't have had a detailed knowledge. So they accepted that. And we also did some research and found out that in the part of Afghanistan where he actually lived, the local currency was the US dollar, not the Afghan rupee. And he had said in his in his interview that the local that the currency was the US dollar. And so in fact he was correct in that. So we put up those arguments and he also had a had a, a copy of a UK visa um, and you know, they didn't accept this in his first hearing, but the appeal, the appeal hearing, they accepted um, that he, he would have had to have I, Afghan ID at some stage in order to, to secure this. So the appeal tribunal didn't agree on the balance of probabilities that he was Afghani, using, I suppose, the arguments that we, that we had presented. So once we'd got over the hurdle of proving his nationality, the next part of it seemed well, was pretty straightforward, you know, um, he had medical reports um, that he'd gotten in, in Ireland um, that were consistent with um, being in an explosion. He, he, he had also physical evidence of wounds with photographic evidence. We also had a psychology report, psychological report from Sparassi, which was hugely useful. And, you know, we could also just show that there was a state protection in Afghanistan. So, you know, he, he was granted uh, refugee status. So that was a, a positive outcome. The second case then I'm going to look at is a Pakistani female who married a man outside of her caste. Um, she was threatened by her family. She and her husband came to Ireland in 2014 using a tourist visa to come in. They were both working here. And then her partner got involved in a road traffic accident and the guard he got involved as, as they do or obviously as they have to in road traffic accidents. And they discovered that he was in the country illegally. So, they sought asylum and claimed that they had been threatened in their own country. They were refused in their first interview and they were also refused um, on appeal um, because one of the things with international protection is that you have to seek asylum as soon as you land in the country or as soon as possible. You can't wait. They waited three years, so that, that worked against them. There was no evidence whatsoever of threats or police reports. Now, any of these on their own won't be detrimental to a case, but when you have a lot of things working against you, it's very difficult to get a case through. Um, when they went to their hearing, they were both called in one after the other, and their stories were actually different. There was quite a lot of discrepancies in their stories, so that affects their credibility. And also, if you do research on Pakistan, even though it mightn't be the greatest police system in the world, um, there is an adequate and good police system there, so state protection was available to them. So there, so all of these issues uh, worked against them. So, as I said, any one of these wouldn't be um, 
detrimental to a case, but when you have a, a lot of um, issues like this stacked against you, it, it's, it's difficult to get a side of. So there's two um, case studies, one which was pretty straightforward once we got the nationality issue um, proven. Second one was more difficult because it, it, it just the story just didn't it didn't stack up. Now, quite possible that the second story was <clears throat> was perfectly valid and perfectly true, but they just didn't meet the threshold for uh, getting refugee status or, or even subsidiary protection. So that is the asylum system, which was the main part of this particular presentation. I may have seen that I've, that I've run through it because there's quite a bit in it. The presentation is going to be up on the NALA website and I'll take as many questions as you want. Or uh, if any of you want to contact me, please feel free. The next part, I'm just give, going to give you two or three minutes on the right to work and a very, very short slide or two on the issues with regards to driving license, which I know people have been asking about. So asylum seekers, you probably know this by now, have, have, can apply for work permit nine months after submitting an application for asylum. It must be renewed every six months. And once it's granted, it's renewable through the appeals process. Now, there's a lot of exceptions, ands, buts, ifs, with regards to this, but, the, but that's the main, that, that's a very crude generalization of it. So nine months after they've applied for asylum, they can apply for work permit. They can't um, get employment in public bodies, defense forces, Gardaí. Um, there's others, and these are subject to review. The, the ES also submitted, our <clears throat> Department of Education submitted a letter in July 2018 saying that um, eligible applicants, that's people work permits, may be entitled to avail of further education training in the same manner as Irish citizens. So you've probably come across that in your own ETBs that um, asylum seekers with work permits are getting access to more and more courses. Asylum seekers are not permitted to have a driver license. Now, there's three different strands at work trying to solve this problem because obviously it's very, very difficult if you have a job and you're allowed to work, but you can travel. So someone obviously can work as a delivery driver, may not be able to work in construction. A lot of asylum seekers live in rural Ireland, probably can't get to work. So the first thing that's happening is the Department of Transport, Tourism and Sport are reviewing this. Now that's been ongoing since 2019. There are also proceedings in the High Court with regards to this. Now, um, the law is on hold at the moment, um, with the exception of um, urgent or serious matters. Um, and obviously this is an urgent and serious matter. So there's a High Court case sometime this year. Um, or there's a judgment, there's actually a judgment due. The case was, the case was, sorry, the case was um, before Christmas. The, the judgment is due on that. And um, there have also been successful cases at the Workplace Relations Commission, two cases in the Workplace Relations Commission, where people were actually granted a driving license, but then the state appeals those decisions, so those uh, appeals are ongoing. One of those was a Pakistani national who lived in Ireland since 2015, and when he came to Ireland, he sought asylum. He was granted an employment permit, and he worked as a delivery man but using a bike. So he wanted to, I suppose, increase his wages or get better work, or obviously it, it, sometimes it can be difficult, in, it's certainly in Ireland, work as a delivery man just on a bike alone, given the weather conditions in the wintertime. So he made a complaint <clears throat> to the Workplace Relations Commission that he wasn't given a, yeah, he applied for a, a learner permit to allow him to drive a car and he was refused um, on the grounds that he couldn't produce a GNIB stamp for or an EU passport to show he was normally resident in Ireland. So somebody, I suppose, coming in on holidays from America can drive. I think au pairs can actually get a driving license, but asylum seekers, if asylum seekers can drive, if they've got an international license, that only works up for one year, but they can't get an Irish driver's license. So the WRC found that he suffered indirect discrimination because he was been asked to produce documentation that it was impossible for him to obtain. He just couldn't get that documentation. So the WRC orders that he should be granted a, a license and paid compensation, but the state has appealed that decision and <clears throat> we're waiting to hear um, on that particular appeal. So driver licenses, they can't get driver's licenses at the moment. 
um, even though they can work. So that is, um, yeah, that's the end of the presentation. And I'll take some questions now from Fergus and or from Fergus. And as as I said, those of you that um, want further information on this presentation, it's going to be on the website. And absolutely feel free to email me or uh, send me any questions. Or if you want me to do look at any of those issues in in further detail, I'd be happy to do that in in other webinars or even for your own ETBs. Okay, Fergus.